about to head out to go to Austin, Texas next week for the Passive Income Mastermind Retreat, tell me, who is it that you can't wait to hear what he has to present? I'm going to say Seth Bradley, the Passive Income Attorney. I'm excited okay. to hear him talking about how to leverage your network to raise capital, how to put together deals with other people's money. And we've we've had a lot of interest in that. But the key is, how do you do it legally? How do you get paid for it without going to jail and all the, all the things? So I'm interested because that's a that's the that's on the horizon, I think, for for me and for you is. Well, that's a, next, that's a next level strategy, right? I mean, that's yeah. how you get from going at this pace where you're just kind of you're making some passive income opportunities. That's how you immediately 10x opportunities. Well, I that's think what I get excited about this group for is it naturally takes you to that next level. Agree or disagree? We, we no I agree. I think we've been going through the process, right? I mean, initially learning how all this stuff works and then doing it ourselves, putting our own money in the deals. But I think the next level is naturally to start raising other people's money, right? Like you're, we're doing all the heavy lifting. We're putting all the stuff together and have learned the process. Why would we continue to only limit our opportunities to what you're your money and my money can do because when you have more money, you have more opportunities. You can get involved in things. There's when you, when you got $2 million or $20 million, the opportunities are so much larger than when you have 200,000 or only $2 million. That's right. Right. And how many of you listening have had friends, family, coworkers, other people hearing what you're up to and they're like, how could I get involved? And you yep. really can't, if you can't answer that question with, oh, this is how we do it, that's why we're going to learn this kind of stuff. I'll tell you, I'm excited about just following up with our good friend, Mitch Steven. That yeah. guy is going to be on a panel at the event. And I'm just telling you, his, his way of looking at real estate and owner financing deals for people is, is brilliant. It's just like our land flipping business, but he does it with homes. He makes it affordable for people uh, in his area. I, I think there's so much that I don't understand about that, that I just can't wait to, to spend some time with him off offline. And even while he's on the panel to, to just learn what I can. No, it, it's going to be a great time out in Austin. Looking forward to, to learning and sharing. And if you're not going to be on that trip, I, I hope that you will uh, find time uh, to be with us. We're going to do the same thing in the fall. We're going to be in Scottsdale, Arizona. We've lined up uh, some speakers already. We got some exciting news to share with you on that. Real quick, before we jump into this, I, we had a couple of corrections as we were recording our spreadsheet. One had um, partial information. We didn't have income and expenses for some of our stuff. We had net numbers, and we've updated that. So we're going to put the actual official spreadsheet, uh, a screenshot of it for you inside the notes. So if you have something that you like looking at, Want you to do that, but also through that process, realize that there was an accounting error there, and our short-term rental business didn't have quite as much income as we actually thought it did. And so our net, instead of being forty-eight thousand uh, net passive income for the um, for the month of April, it was actually only forty thousand, Joey. So now we got way more work to do. We're gonna have to really figure out some things when we're in Austin to help us get that ex extra eight grand back. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. It's time to get serious and, and start building that passive income right back up. So we hope that you guys get a lot out of this uh, report every single month. Shoot us, um, shoot us a message in a community and let us know what you like about it, what you'd love for us to, to learn more about. If you're interested in something, maybe we can look into that for you and add it into our portfolio over the next uh, six months to a year. So Thanks as always. We're going to jump into this episode right now. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? 
Now here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Ooh, another month, Russ. I'm I'm so excited to be able to report on our passive income journey in April of 2022. How about you? Well, looking at the numbers, looks like we had a little bit of growth, not a ton, but a little bit of growth where we saw some success, I think, in our our land business, our short-term rental business. Our crypto mining was kind of going the opposite way and <laughs> and, and, and didn't didn't have a whole lot of things happening other there. I, I did have one success story, man. Okay. The the apartment complex I invested in like five or six years ago. I finally got paid. Like, like Bring out the champagne, man. Are you serious? I, mean, I didn't get paid much. I mean, I, I don't want to really <laughs> disclose what my my average analyzed rate of return is on that deal. It's probably two and a half, three percent. But I, I this, got I got a check. Is this one of those moments for us where return of capital is more important than the return on capital? <laughs> is that what you would say? Well, you know, like it. <laughs> I am grateful to get the return of my principal, no doubt. And, you know, they had to throw in a little extra money in there at the end to, to top it off. So I got a little bit more than what I put in. It wasn't a lot. But, you know, Joey, it, the beauty of this thing, the Lord works fabulously, right? And I got this check in. And I, the same week I'd gotten the check or the notice from my um accountant that says here's how much money you owe to the federal government here's how much you owe to the state and it was roughly about the same amount of money so i just took that and i just handed it over but it was great it just came in and went out and i didn't have to <laughs> cough up any other money that that i had stored off to the side so that was a win for me i thought nice nice good call all right so let's let's break this down let's talk about some of the things that are behind the scenes okay let's talk about and let's let's focus on the land business for a minute. First of all, if you don't know what we're talking about when we say the land business, if this is new to you, this report, we buy raw land at 25 cents on the dollar, turn around and sell that land at retail value on a note income basis. So we make it a very affordable transaction for somebody to buy land from us, raw land, and they pay us monthly over five, six, seven, eight years. Hey, and and I, can I tell you a story about this? Because actually you saw the group text. Tao had messaged me the other day and said, hey, by the way, I end up with some lots. I bought this development. We we flipped some houses in there and then I end up with four lots. And I, I know you guys have this land business. I want to talk to you and pick your brain about what is the best way to sell those. And so I jumped on the call with him and said, okay, tell me what you're working with. I said, the guy that sold me the whole development ultimately was going to buy these four lots, but then it's backed out. And I was like, well, how much was he going to pay for the lots? He said, probably about 10 grand a piece. And it's like, I'm just trying to think about how would I do this based upon what you guys are doing? I said, well, first, the neighbors are your best purchaser. Mark Podolsky always tells us that. The neighbors are the first people that you want to go to. Let them know, hey, I'm getting ready to put this on the market. And I want to give you first tips. Think about that's exactly how you and I acquired the house around the corner here that we were going to make our corporate retreat is that the neighbor said, hey, by the way, I'm getting ready to put the house on the market. And we were like, we're in. right? like like a perfect spot for us. Yeah. Yeah. So we want to talk to them. And I said, go, go do that. Secondly, if they, if they decline, that's fine. Then you're going to post on Facebook marketplace. You're going to post on Craigslist, but here's how you're going to sell this thing. What do people care about, Joey? Do they care about the price or they care about the payments? Always the payment. The payments, man. And there's so many people out there that want to buy and own property, but never think that they can because they don't have $10,000. $10,000 might as well be a billion dollars. And here's an exact story. Megan and I get married in 2002. Her grandfather in 2003, he's a year or two from passing. He knows his health's declining. He decides he's going to start writing every one of his grandchildren a check for ten thousand dollars a year because at that time that was the you know that that was the gifting you know you could do up to ten thousand dollars without having to to file it as a gift um, of your estate tax stuff you know right right and so she gets this check for ten thousand dollars 
And I thought we had won the lottery. Like it was like, <laughs> I mean, $10,000. That was a lot of money. Like I didn't know what to do with $10,000. And I think there's so many people out there like that. They, like the idea of spending $10,000 for land, because you can't go buy a lot. Like a bank's not going to give you the money for that a $10,000 loan. No, so you got to have $10,000. Yeah. There, there's so many people that are like, I don't have that. And so I was like, but you go to the pop, you go out there and you say, here's how you buy this property. You just make it like a car payment, right? You let them finance in it. And by the way, you don't, if you wanted to get $10,000 in cash for it, what would you be willing to sell it on terms for Joey? Less or more? Uh, more. More, a lot more, right? Exactly. You can have the price or the terms. You just can't have both, <laughs> right? Exactly. So if somebody wants to buy something on terms, then I get to dictate the price. So with that, yeah, I said, you probably bump that thing up to like 15 grand, 20 grand and divide it by the number of payments that makes it make sense for this person. Have them put a monthly payment down and that, that amount of money for the next 48 months, 60 months, 72 months, you name it. Well, and I and said, you know, and here, here's the best thing about this. And he, he got super excited when I told him this, Joey. I said, you know what the, the ideal scenario is, is that you sell all four of these lots on terms and about two and a half to four years in, they default. <laughs> Quit paying you. <laughs> hey, we're not hoping for that. Okay, Russ. We're not hoping for the, the worst case scenario. That's the best case scenario. That's not the worst case scenario. Wor worst case for somebody else. They didn't I'm, not, I'm not hoping on for them. I'm just saying from a best case scenario, like you and I have a life settlement fund, right? That's right. Best case scenario for us, everybody dies immediately. <laughs> Right? <laughs> if you own an insurance policy on someone else, the best case scenario for you is that they die immediately. I, I, if you don't know them. Right? Exactly. Like, exactly. Now, if I, mean, if I own an insurance policy on you, which I do, Joey, the best case scenario for me is not that you die immediately. Please don't die immediately. Thank you for clarifying that. But if I go buy an insurance policy that already exists on someone that I don't know, right? I, two things. One, I pray that they know the Lord. And two, I hope that they meet him as quickly as possible. <laughs> this, this conversation is derailing. No, but, this, but that, I just wanted to, I get to, to bring that into the thing. You, I get, you the, get point. the point where I'm at. But, but here's the other part that I want to point out about this. And if you don't know what we're talking about, you can go to thelandgeek.com to learn more about this whole process. That's how we got introduced to this was through Mark Podolsky and the Land Geek. Um, so anyways, go check that out. But the other thing I want to point out is it gives you the ability when you start thinking this way, that somebody that is a buyer for your property, you can make the terms fit what they really desire or what they can afford. And so you get people that say, well, hey, I want to put on the 10,000. I'm going to use the $10,000 price point you just gave. I've got $2,000 to put down and but I can only afford $200 a month. You can work with that person and you can then just extend out how long do you want to receive that $200 to make the actual profit that you're looking for? Well, well here's a win on this. If you if you apply this to everything, man, if you have a car you want to sell, go list it. <laughs> go list it for monthly payments. Exactly. You're going to get a lot more money than if you try to sell it for cash. Now, exactly. people will go, oh, well, what happens if, right? Well, add a premium for that. Figure out how you would go get it back if they quit paying you. Figure out all the little details. Add a premium to it. There's there's ways to do this. This is like when you start thinking in payments, and that's what I told when we when we were talking, Tal and I were talking, and he's like, well, I don't really care what anything costs. I just care about the payments. In real estate, right, you're buying a piece of property. All you're trying to do is figure out what is it going to cost me to, to operate it, to manage yeah. it. And then what can I make on top of it? There's where I'm living. I'm living in the spread in the middle. Exactly. And I, and it, whether it's land flipping or the next business on the list, which is our short-term rental business, we're doing the exact same thing, aren't we, Joey? We are. We are. We're, not, we're not paying for the property. How are we buying it? So we rent each one of these units from a current owner landlord. And then we turn around and rent it on a short-term basis through different places like Airbnb, Booking.com, VRBO, and the like. And we make all the difference of what we made on a short-term basis versus what we pay on a long-term basis to the landlord.
Well, and we were just being interviewed on an actual podcast where all they do is short-term rental properties, right? But they normally, they're, they're buying properties and they're, they're doing it in the mountains, they're doing it at the lake, they're doing it at the beach, right? These high-end destinations. Mm-hmm. And there was one thing the person said, and I, I want to bring this up, that, and I obviously wasn't going to say anything on the podcast, but they were like, you know, that whole arbitrage thing is really interesting, and we don't really have a lot of people that talk about that on our show. But they really just it, – it, I guess that works in your city, but it doesn't work down here at the beach, you know, because – People are, you know, they're just not going to do that. If they own the property, either they're going to do it themselves or they're going to rent it out to someone for long term. They're just not going to do this arbitrage. And I was like, well, couldn't I be the long term tenant? <laughs> Wouldn't I be the long term tenant? Well, the idea of someone doing it themselves mm-hmm. is implying that they would learn what we learned, right? Like, right. How much money and time, Joey, did we spend in order to learn how to do it properly? Oh, it, it took us a, a solid year and about 25 grand to do that. Right. It, people are just not going to do that. They're not going to take the time. They're not going to spend the money. They're looking, they're looking for long-term tenants for their real estate. Most of the real estate investors out there who are in the in, in the cash flow world are just looking for quality long-term tenants. And we become one of the best long-term tenants that a landlord could ever have because our units are taken care of at the highest level. We have them professionally cleaned multiple times a week, right? We, we have, we have smoke detectors, we have noise uh, alerts, we have um, cameras outside of them protecting them. We, we do things to ensure our product, right? That's the thing that is valuable to us. So we're going to maintain it at a much higher level than somebody's renting your place for a year is going to do. I mean, absolutely. I, think, think about that. Like, think about when you were in college and you were renting places, right? Yeah, you, you weren't taking care of it, for no, sure. No, heck no. And now, I know that's the worst case scenario, but we are the best case scenario. That's right. By the way, we're, we're talking about something that we've actually built a course on this because in the month of April, we actually netted over 20,000, 20,404 from our short term rental business that is fully managed by an operator. That's after he's paid, after all the rental, you know, uh, rent that we have to owe on all these units is paid, all the expenses for cleaning, everything you can think of. The net of it is 20,404 in the month of April. If you want to learn how to get your very first unit up and running, the way we're talking about, we built a course specifically for you. Go to wealthwithoutwashing.com forward slash STR course, and you can get access to that today. This podcast is amazing. Almost too amazing, Russ. There's too many ideas, and I don't know where to get started creating passive income. Well, here's the thing, Joey. I think one of the things you need to consider in that statement is what is it costing you to not know? What is it costing you not to take action? I love the statement that says you don't have to be great to start. You just have to start to be great. If you're struggling on where to start, you have to know what type of investor you are. Know your investor DNA. And if you want to learn more about this, you can join us in our Passport Challenge at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash passport. Get started today. Um, now we didn't, we didn't, we kind of went over this Russ, but the land business in the month of April actually netted us $15,032. And that was an increase of almost 2% from the year or excuse me, the month before. So I'm just kind of adding these things up. So as you're listening, you can hear where we're at so far. Now let's roll down to the Ethereum miners. What happened in the month of April as it relates to crypto? Well, we've seen a a significant decline in the overall crypto market, which you and I, in this report, we mine Ethereum, which is just one of many cryptocurrencies out there. I think it has the second largest um, holding or market share behind Bitcoin. And we've seen the prices decline pretty significantly on that. Now, our, our mining of it, how much we are getting of the coins, is roughly the same as it has always been. I actually expect we just see an uptick 
uptick because usually when you see a price decline from a mining mm-hmm. perspective, it weeds out certain miners, right? Because it costs a lot of money to manage the power and everything else that has to, to do with that. And when it when that price drops, you will get rid of a lot of the people that have a lot of old machines, maybe running one or two machines, and it just isn't worth the expense for them to actually go upside down on it. So I, I expect us to actually see an uptick in a, how much of the currency we're getting paid, but with the price being a lot less. I mean, I think we, we reported on that we had $2,700 or something like that, Joey, is what our price was for the month of April. It, it was you know, a couple hundred dollars higher than that. As we're recording this in May of 2022, the price is significantly lower. So we're going to see those numbers down. But how are you feeling about that? Like from a, you know, people ask me all the time, they say, what do you think about crypto? Where on the hierarchy of wealth would you put this, right? So if you've never heard us talk about the hierarchy of wealth, at the very bottom, you have cash and cash value, right? That's our that's our liquid reserve. That's our, where our money sits, right? Above that, when we start to invest, the first place we invest is in things that we can control. Right. Us as individuals are the things. When Joey said, hey, if you're interested in short-term rentals, take a course, right? You know, Go through a mastermind. Learn how to do this yourself. Anytime you're investing in yourself, that's always going to be the best place. Then the next place to invest is investing in things with collateral. A lot of times people think about that as real estate. Sometimes they think about businesses, right? And the last place on that hierarchy would be speculation. That's when we are investing in things that you're hoping that's going to grow in the future, but you have no ability to influence this outcome. People ask me, Joey, where do I think the hierarchy of wealth or how does crypto fit on the hierarchy of wealth? And I say right now, I feel like it's definitely category four speculation. But I believe as time continues to move on that it is moving down into level three that okay why why is that why do you say that well level three is collateral right mm-hmm. collateralized assets well, what's the collateral joey behind ethereum and bitcoin i don't know that's what i'm asking you the network mm-hmm. the blockchain network the the world and, and i don't understand it so please if you're you know an expert in this space just close your ears because you know i'm gonna foul this up <laughs> And for everybody else, this is dumbed down to my level. So hopefully it it helps you as well. But this is the network that the world is being built on. We're seeing technologies. We're seeing healthcare systems. We're seeing government systems that are being put on this network because of its ease of transaction, its transparency, its ability to be infallible as it relates to once that transaction has happened, you can see it. It's happening. People want to transfer money into these small countries, right? Like, if you've ever tried to do a Western Union, you know, sitting up there for an hour and a half at the Wind dixie watching that person try to figure this out and then <laughs> sending it to whoever it is on the other end of it. And they're showing up wondering if it's there. There's nobody talking between them, telling them when it shows up like that is a disaster. Well, now the cryptocurrency is solving that problem in these small countries. Like it is the ability for someone to to send money to someone else. And it happened within a few minutes. And, and, and taking out the middle person, we, we've seen, you know, one of our speakers that's going to be down there uh, in Austin, Texas with us next next week at our uh, passive income retreat. He just got back from El Salvador. He's been helping El Salvador change their national currency to Bitcoin. Right. We know that these smaller countries are adopting this because the banking world there is crazy and yeah. they don't have the stability inside of, you know, the ability to, to transact business from one uh, part of the province to another. Well, we're going to see that happening over time. But for us, this network is the collateral. To me, I'm equating it to like the internet. Like there is no going back. Like there is no world without the internet. In yeah. the future, the way that I've been explained, there is no world without the network of blockchain. So when when we look at the price and we see it bouncing all over the place and everybody's like, oh, that's just crazy You know, people are just speculating on the currency. That thing's going to go away. It's going to be like those, uh, you know, MC Hammer pants I had back in the, you know, late (laughs) 80s. Like these things are going. But that's not the case right now. There's some of these cryptocurrencies that that may go away. But the network, Ethereum and uh, Bitcoin. technology itself. That technology is going to be the collateral. And I, I feel like 
it's going to move from speculative down into that collateralized asset. So. Well, I, I see that, but my gut instinct was to take it to the, all the way to the bottom. Because right now, if I put cash in the, the very first tier of this hierarchy of wealth, Bitcoin, Ethereum, any cryptocurrency that is tradable for goods and service is going to take the place of that dollar. That is where I think of it in, in terms of this hierarchy is I, I can see your point. The, the technology could be the collateral, but I think the currency itself will eventually become that first tier. And that's what you and I are doing. So just to be clear, when we are mining crypto, we are not turning around and trading it for US dollars because we are holding this crypto for the future. This is a, a long-term strategy that we're saying, we want to start trading our dollars for crypto in the sense of, of putting currency in the right location, not in a dropping um, asset like a, the US dollar. It is well, going to- And, and, and I think the way that we have to think about it, because when you hear people talking about it, they say, I'm gonna buy crypto. I'm gonna buy Bitcoin. Is this today the day to buy Bitcoin? Like Bitcoin's down 55% off its high. Is today the time to buy Bitcoin? That's not the question to be asking. That's not what's really happening. Is today the day to be selling my dollars exactly. for this new currency? Because that's really what you're doing. You're selling your dollars. If you go to Mexico, you're going to sell USD if you want to get peso, right? If you're going to go to Europe, you're going to sell USD for the euro. You're not saying, is today the best time to buy? Now, I do realize there's an exchange rate, right? But that's what we're doing. We're selling our, our U.S. dollars for for Bitcoin. And I, I heard some friends of ours, guys I listen to their podcasts. I love their podcasts. They they're, they they speak at a really high level. But I, I'm going to challenge without calling them out, just you and I having a conversation here. It, they were talking about how Bitcoin or Ethereum or lots of other cryptocurrencies were not cash flowing assets. And that's where people are failing. And they're saying, you know, at the end of the day, you got to find cash flowing assets. And these are these are just items no different than gold that you're sticking money in and can't access it without recognizing it by selling it. Now, Joey, I think, again, that's just one of those things where you and I have been digging in this maybe a little deeper than the average person. Right. Is you and I know there are ways, right? There are ways to access USD without getting rid of our Bitcoin, without getting rid of our Ethereum. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I'm probably the last person that you want to share about this, but using a DeFi platform, um, like for instance, BlockFi is one that we've used. You can store your crypto on their platform and they can use that as collateral that you can then borrow against it. Um, now, we have not done this personally. I have not done this yet. Uh, but I intend to, the, the real kicker is, is they typically run about 50 to 60% maybe of what you actually show in your wallet. That so you if you had a hundred thousand dollars of Bitcoin, they right. give you a loan of up to 50 to $60,000 against it. That's right. That's right. Okay. And that's due in part because of the volatility of the actual asset that's backing that. And, and I get that. That makes sense. There's no different than a, you know, uh, um, uh, an account that you would have against a market-based asset that banks will lend against. So it's it's very similar in nature to that. But well, and, and I, I see that as a way to almost practice infinite banking against an asset like crypto. Well, it, when it, and this is the beauty of this, right? Like when we see when we start to see real estate the equity in real estate, the equity in businesses, the equity within our crypto as being very similar in nature. And what do we do? We want to use leverage. We want to get access to the actual money so that we can create new assets, right? That's right. So if we're okay borrowing money against our life insurance contracts, if we're okay borrowing money against our real estate, we're okay borrowing money against our businesses, why are we not okay borrowing money against our Bitcoin or Ethereum, right? It, it, there is no difference there except lack of knowledge of the process. 
That's right. And, and so like you and I are in the process right now are getting ready to sell a property to do the first Bitcoin real estate transaction in the state of Alabama. I am super stoked by this. But but talk about the fact that how many of these attorneys are frightened. We, I mean, we could get any attorney that we could call. We call on how many attorneys, uh, closing attorneys, and none of them wanted to do it because they're just frightened because it's unknown. Exactly. Yeah. When well, you're the, the trailblazer in any sort of uh, transaction or industry, you're going to face this sort of reaction. But this is exactly what we felt is, you know, I, I bet we talked to six or eight different closing attorneys that are well known. And none of them, they all kind of held up their hands like, nope, not me, not this time. I'll wait for somebody well, because, else to kind of to set the stage for that. They're fearful. But, you know, I, I get to, uh, you know, work out with a lot of different real estate people. And, you know, some friends of mine had me in a, a group text the other day. And they, 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 I think he was setting me up. He knew that he knew we were doing this Bitcoin thing. So he sent uh, a group text with me and two other real estate agents this thing about Kentucky doing its first Bitcoin real estate transaction. And the two, before I even saw it, the two real estate agents inside the group text both said, Alabama will be dead last to, to be on this train. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, mm, I am not that I'm going to be that station. last. Pulling and and both station. of them, yeah, both of them are like, what? You know, like, tell me how that goes, right? everybody's interested to see how it goes and I'm excited for us. Right. Like, and be honest, since that, since we got under contract, the price of Bitcoin has dropped like 30, 35%. And I'm just like, yes, yes. Come on. I mean, cause all we're going right, to be- explain that, explain that. Why do you, why are you like cheering the fact that we have a property that we have sold for Bitcoin and the price of Bitcoin is dropping. You're excited about it. Well, one, we have not, we, we're just on a contract. We hadn't sold it yet. Okay. okay. <laughs> so it, you know, this past year, Bitcoin's, you know, hit 68,000 or something a coin. And right now it's sitting around 30,000 a coin. And and I, I think it may drop to 25,000, may drop to 20,000 a coin. I don't know. But I, again, having conversations with people who know, as far as what the network is, the collateral behind it. Mm-hmm are telling me, Russ, the world is being built on this thing. Everything is pointing to, to this being the future. And nobody knows what the price of the coins will be. But we do know that the coins are moving toward a 0% inflation, meaning that there was only 21 million Bitcoin created, and they went all released at once. And every single year now, we're at a point where the amount being released is half as much as it was the previous year. So we're literally moving where inflation is going towards zero as compared to our U.S. dollar where they're printing dollars and our inflation rate is moving toward 12 percent. Right. Right. So we're we are creating an asset that's going to hold value like no other asset out there that we have seen. And the price is dropping because we're getting rid of a lot of these retail investors that jumped in, you know, over the last, you know, six to 12 months trying to speculate on its currency. And now they're getting their butt whipped and they're heading for the hills. Right. Yeah. And, and they probably need that money. And like you and I, we're not touching that money. That's not, you know, and if we were, we're not going to sell it. We're going to borrow against it. Like you said a second ago. Right. Cause we understand that concept. So man, let it, let that price keep dropping <laughs> because we're going to, that all that means we're just going to get more Bitcoin. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> and that's just going to give us, that's going to make this real estate transaction even that much better. And I know we got to wrap up here, but really quickly, we said we are not, uh, we, we told you guys, uh, we are not going to take an L. Th this is too important. Like the Wealth Without Wall Street tribe is too important for us to have bought this property and sold it and take an L because we intentionally meant to sell this, not to sell it. We bought it to make it a corporate retreat. We, we had grand visions for how this was going to sit inside of our short-term rental portfolio and host families, uh, host uh, businesses, host uh, you know wedding parties, and and unfortunately the 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 community and the the city that it was in revolted against us. That's right. I said, all right, we're going to sell it, and you and I are going to not only have bought a property without paying cash, without getting a mortgage on it because we bought it subject to. 
And now we're going to turn around and not sell it for cash. We're going <laughs> to sell it for Bitcoin. Could we, could we make it any more interesting? Like this is, this is just gold. It, it really is. It's not gold. Digital it's, gold. It's digital, digital gold. gold in so many ways. All right. So we got to wrap up. So at the end of the day, our, our spreadsheet's a little funky this this um, month because we didn't have a lot of time to go through all the income expenses. So we were able to net everything out. We ended up with $48,355 this past month in passive income. This is dollars that came in as us working in the B and I quadrant. This is not our S quadrant business. This isn't the insurance business that we do uh, working with, with people, helping them with infinite banking. This is stuff that we are just purely investors in or business owners where other people are running the business for us. That's a little bit, uh, almost 2% greater than the previous month. We're working our way back up. Again, our goal here is 100,000 a month in passive income. We're not, we're about halfway there. We're gonna keep working. We got some some things in the uh, works for the summer that we're going to multiply on. But I'm grateful that uh, you get the chance to hopefully see this and get use this as experience for you. If you have questions, if you're not already a member of our community, jump into our community, wealthwhitewallstreet.com forward slash passport. Take action on getting a goal. Talk about whether or not you're an accredited investor or not accredited investor. We have two specific groups that help people get to financial freedom, both our inner circle for non-accredited investors, our passive income mastermind for accredited investors. We're grateful to help you exercising uh, that that process and understand how to get there while supporting you along the way. Joey, final thoughts. I, no, I, I think that this is a, a great end of the month and uh, grateful to be able to share this with each of you. And as you mentioned, Russ, like this is not to beat our own chest. This is because we want to be accountable to each of you, uh, that you are a part of this tribe and we owe this to you to let you know what's working, what's not working, and to pivot and make changes because this is a imperfect road. There's nothing about building a passive income portfolio that is simple or easy. And you need to know that before you go down this path. But just know if two morons like us can do this, you can absolutely do this. And we're here to support you. So thank you as always for joining us for this report and all of our episodes. If you got value from it, please share it. Please um, rate and review us because that's how other people find us. And uh, you can help them get on the same path that you are. So thanks as always. And we'll catch you on the next episode. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.